New immigration rule stirs up more controversy. President Trump heads to Paris. Newly elected Congresswoman for New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, blames Electoral College for not being able to move to D.C. yet. And over half of the residents of San Francisco are talking about leaving the state of California altogether. So starting off today, there has been a new immigration rule that came out yesterday that will block uh, asylum seekers who cross the country illegally and without going through the port of entry from being eligible to apply for asylum. Now the reason this stirs up controversy is because under current U.S. law, there is nothing stating when and where you can apply for asylum. And with this uh, new rule in play, it basically says that you have to come through to the port of entry so that way their, their line of thinking with this is that if you go through the port of entries and that's going to be the way you get asylum, it'll be a more of a controlled, orderly, and lawful thing that will occur as opposed to it being the way it is now where it isn't, it's kind of chaotic and a lot of people are denied and so this is trying to fix that and also in my opinion deter illegal immigrants from trying to seek asylum after entering in the country illegally when they should have went through the asylum process before entering the country so fortunately this is stirring up a lot of controversy i could see why but at the same time it is apparent to me that this is a good thing and the reason i say that is because it's just going to keep things more structured than they were before. And especially since we don't know who is coming into the country and who exactly is filing for asylum, now we can definitely you know, go through that process uh, correctly with this new rule. But we'll see how it goes, how it all plays out as the caravan gets closer and as the people who are seeking asylum go through that port of entry and go through the new process that is being set up. Now, President Trump is actually heading out to Paris today. He actually left earlier today, I believe, after holding a press conference. And uh, this meeting in Paris is to basically uh, commemorate the end of World War I with 60 other world leaders. And one of the biggest things that are going on there is President Trump and President Putin uh, potentially meeting to talk about the INF treaty that the U.S. has said that they're going to withdraw from. And Russia states that, you know, this is going to upset the strategic nuclear balance between the two. But like we've covered in prior episodes, I believe this is a good thing President Trump did because Russia wasn't even following the INF treaty for years and completely disregarded all of, you know, all of the attempts we did to call them out on their inappropriate behavior in breaking that treaty. Not only that, but as we also covered, this withdrawal allows to renegotiate and to potentially bring in China, which should definitely be in the INF Treaty Agreement as well because they're more of a threat than Russia is. And the only reason we had to deal with Russia is because the Soviet Union was extremely dangerous back in the day back you know so that's why we had the treaty with them and only them to make sure that the United States and the Soviet Union at the time wouldn't go out in a bang and you know essentially destroy the whole world with nuclear warfare now we have to include China in that to mitigate the effects of superpowers bumping heads and hopefully take away all nuclear weapons that would be the most ideal thing so we'll see where this goes as it unfolds over the weekend. Now, in other news, Congresswoman Ocasio uh, Cortez, uh, Ele sorry, butchering her name, Alexa Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, blames the Electoral College for not being able to afford an apartment in D.C. and saying that that's why she cannot go there right now because she cannot afford it. It's just not reasonable for her to do that. She can't get a salary until I believe January or uh, I believe. And so she's complaining about that, which is completely asinine to me 
the reason I say this is because there are several Congress people right now who live in their office. Who live in their office. They make $174,000 a year in Washington, D.C.'s a very expensive place to live. So, because they have to keep a residence in their state in which they're representing and be in D.C. Monday through Friday, most Congress people decide, not most, but some decide, including Speaker of the House Paul Ryan, to stay in their office while they're in D.C. Monday through Friday. They save money and they can afford their residency back in their home district. Now, this is a little insane to me that she is complaining. Not only is the fact that she's complaining about the electoral system, which New York, I just have to say, this is somebody who's representing your state. You know, you, I know not the whole state elected her. A certain district did. But this is what, this, this is what happens when you elect extreme left-wingers into office. They have no clue of what the electoral system actually is and what its purpose is. And then they start blaming it on totally irrelevant things. And they start complaining that they can't start their job because they can't afford to start their job. I mean, what the hell? How are you going to afford to maintain a residency in your own home and a residency in Washington, D.C.? New York's an expensive place to live and Washington, D.C. is an expensive place to live. How are you going to manage that? Really? If, if you're only going to be accepting $174,000 from your government salary, how do you plan on actually affording two residencies in two states that are very expensive to live in? It just, I mean, come on. Seriously. The smart thing for anybody to do in that position would be to say, you know what? I'm just going to stay in my office. It may not be the best thing to do, but I'm not here to live luxurious. I'm here to serve the people. That's what you do. You know how much Congress people and senators got paid back in the day? Not much. Not much at all. Now they get paid several times more than the average American. I'm not saying they don't deserve that pay because they do do a lot of work. And some of them are corrupt. I do know that. But most of them are good people trying to represent their districts and their states with dignity and making sure that the country at large is doing well. However, this to me just seems a little greedy. But, you know, she does come from a wealthy background, so that's probably why she is feeling the need to have an apartment when she goes to D.C. I don't know. This, to me, is just laughable that she even... Entitlement. That's what it is. Entitlement. So, that's what's going on with Ocasio-Cortez, you know, the socialist who just got elected into office, who can't explain why or how... I mean, she can't explain how... She wants to implement, you know, uh, Medicare for all and how she'll pay for it. She she can't explain that. She hasn't given an answer. She just says, you just pay for it. You just pay for it. That's what she says. But she never gives an answer how. Now, uh, going to San Francisco that has implemented policies that Ocasio-Cortez would love to see across the nation, over six over 60% of the people in San Francisco want to leave the state right now because of these far left policies that have been pushing through that Congress people like Orcasio Cortez want to push on the whole nation. For example, San Francisco has rent control. For those of you who don't know that, it just basically means that the government sets a ceiling on how much a landlord can charge people uh, for rent on property. To some people, this may seem like a beautiful idea then the landlords can't screw you over, right? Well, wrong. That's unfortunately where you're wrong. I get what the government wanted to do, except it hurt the people more than it helps them. And here's the reason why. Now, the landlords are suffering because they're capped on how much they can charge. You may say, who cares? They can't be greedy bastards. Fair enough. But if they can't compete with what the market calls for, how are they supposed to upkeep the property and make sure that it's up-to-date on inspections, on, you know, everything that it needs to be as far as, you know, doors, windows, uh, insulation, things of that nature. How are they supposed to, you know, stay up to date on all those if they're not charging what the market's calling for? And how are they supposed to be able to compete? Not only that, but how are they supposed to feed their families? How are they supposed to provide 
for theirs if they can't set wages at a compatible rate. It just doesn't make sense to me. And so that is one thing that is really hurting San Francisco. Not only does it hurt the landlords, but it hurts the tenants too because then they have to live in properties in which the landlord has a difficult time upkeeping because they can't charge the amount of rent that is needed. So on top of that, San Francisco has just passed a proposal to tax everything for uh, every, every aspect of a business so that way they can help combat homelessness. They already pay $389 million, $380 million sorry, to combat homelessness. Now they're stating they need another $300 million. First off, money never solves the issue. I'm surprised people haven't learned this right now. Money never solves the issue. It's a beautiful gesture in which they're trying to do as far as finding homes and sheltering the homeless. That's Yes, I think everybody should have a home. However, at the end of the day, there are some individuals who are homeless due to their own decisions and nobody else's. Obviously, there are some people who got dealt a really crappy hand and now they're out in the streets and it isn't their fault. I'm sure there are some people that are in that predicament. But just throwing money at the problem isn't going to help them. And now San Francisco is calling to, has actually just passed uh, Proposal C, which is going to allow them to tax businesses on everything they bring in. Now, taxes in San Francisco are already at 33%. They're only going to rise. And they're hoping to generate another $300 million through this. This is going to hurt small businesses like all, like like nobody will imagine, like nobody can imagine. I mean, small businesses are the backbone of the employment for Americans. So you're punishing the main employer of America because you want to help homeless people. I get it. It's a noble cause. But you have to look at the whole picture. And it just doesn't make sense to me. Because what's going to end up happening is that companies are going to start leaving the San Francisco area because you're charging them outrageous rates. And they'll move somewhere else where taxes are less intrusive on them. And it, this is also going to hurt people who are entrepreneurs who want to start new businesses in San Francisco, which will then help employ other people, which will then maybe also contribute to reducing homelessness by providing more jobs. Unfortunately, this is going to do the opposite. This is probably going to increase homelessness and increase unemployment in San Francisco in total. But remember, this is the agenda of most of the people on the left right now. There are so many people who have ran for Congress and Senate and even uh, governorships who claim to be moderates, but in reality are extreme progressives with radical ideologies. For instance, Andrew Gillum is one of those people who are running for governor who portrays to be a moderate, but in reality is an extreme progressive. And there was footage of this collected on one of his campaign staff members, uh, you know, calling white people crackers and stating that they need to lie in order to get into office because he's too progressive. And California is typically a red state. This has also happened in other places as well. In Georgia, where Stacey Abrams claims she believes in the Second Amendment. She's running for governor, by the way. There's a, a lot of controversy going on about both of those governor races. And there's actually still voting going on, which is a little strange. Especially being that, especially in Florida, with every other county in Florida already has its votes counted for, and now there's still count, there's like Brow Browman and another county in Florida where they're still counting votes. Anyway, so Stacey Abrams, the governor of Georgia, claims to be a moderate, claims to be for the Second Amendment. She does this because she's in Georgia and it's a heavily red state, and she's trying to flip the governorship. However, while in the state, while she was a state uh, representative, she co-sponsored a bill that would allow the state government to confiscate people's assault rifles. 
and ban them all right, you know, outright. So that's not very moderate, if you ask me. And when confronted on this by this by CNN host Jake Tapper, she couldn't give an answer. She just stayed. Well, she did give an answer, but she really was beating around the bush. What she said was that. I just want to get the conversation started, and that's why I co-sponsored the bill. And that's all I want to do is just get the conversation started with what we can do for gun control. Well, if you wanted to get the conversation started, if a conversation started, then you wouldn't have co-sponsored a legislation that would have the government take away people's weapons. That's not how you get a conversation started. What you do is start a debate. So you know what? Let's make let's take this to the you know to your local journalist. And say, hey, let's start this debate. You know, maybe not tell them that, but just get whatever idea you have in your mind out, and then let it be out there, and then have other people comment on that. That's how you start a conversation. You don't start the conversation by co-sponsoring a bill in hopes that it is going to pass, and then will take away people's arms. That's stupid. So that's what's going on in the news today. And one last thing I want to cover before I get out of here is a article from CNN uh, regarding Ruth Bader Ginsburg's health. She was just released from the hospital earlier today, and a spokesperson of hers said that she is doing okay and that she'll be working from home today. So the three fractured ribs she endured yesterday while in her office, uh, you know, obviously haven't healed, but she's doing okay. So that's good. So it's really good. Hopefully she can maintain in good health. Hopefully nothing bad happens to her and hopefully she can continue to serve on the bench. We'll see. And that's it for the news today. I hope you all have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Hey man, it's Friday. So peace. And by the way, real quick, before I let you guys go, people watching the video, I do apologize. I know my phone just keeps moving around because I am too animated when I speak. I slam my hands on the desk. Yeah. I know. I apologize. I need to become more professional, and I need to get a stand for my phone. I get it. I get it. Because this is a little annoying. I can see the video changing. Anyway, so, yeah. I hope you all have a wonderful Friday and a great weekend. Peace. Okay.